Hi, good morning, one. Welcome once again to Careers Unlimited. We are covering the chapter 11 on care of the pediatric patient in our patient care technician course. And uh, we'll follow um, with um, the next chapter 12 on care of the obstructive patient. But let's focus today on the care of the pediatric child. Now, it's, it's if you have children in the past and if you have trouble understanding their behaviors, either psychological or physical developments and so on, it would be very useful to, to go back and review some of the content material that is covered, not only in this uh, textbook, but also in the nursing assistant uh, textbook where we covered the stages of development. Now, every human being goes through uh, milestones or stages of development things that we must accomplish as human beings. So now that we're at older stages in our life, we, we can reflect upon those stages. And if you have your own children, you can look at them and see uh, specifically at what stage of, of a development they're in, either cognitive development, uh, physical development, psychosocial development, how do they uh, get along with family? And you'll notice that some kids are different than others. Some progress differently, faster, slower, and so on. So it's important to go back and review and understand those developments so that when we see the child, we can understand a lot of their behaviors. So let's get into this chapter so that hopefully maybe you will be interested in caring for this um, type of dem uh, demographic patients. Children, now they vary obviously from uh, one year old up to uh, puberty. So some of these uh, children may be under care and uh, it would be very useful obviously to to be able to care for them in the uh, in the hospital setting. Now, these kids are usually going to be in uh, specialty hospitals. A lot of these hospitals have really catered to um, to their behaviors, to their personalities, you know, to the to the demographics uh, where you know their age uh, their age groups are. Uh, the designs and so on are very uh, focused to them, they're catered to them. So here are the pediatric patients. Now, some of these facilities. Uh, the ones that I visited have, you know, very uh, nice designs. They have uh, youthful colors, very bright, and and it just brings a source of energy to children because as they're developing, they have a lot of energy in them. They can they can uh, uh, grow very fast, and and they they they're all going through different stages uh, in cognitive development, so they understand some things better than others. Uh, but they're able to they're able to um, to understand in general. A concept of um, a fantasy, right? Most of these kids still live in a fantasy world, and uh, this this type of design is very common in a lot of facilities. The furniture you see in the rooms obviously are, are catered to their to their specific age. With some rooms that may have cribs still for those kids that are still very very small, and then you have other rooms that are a little bit more, uh, you know, roomy like, uh, kind of uh, mimic the home environment so the child can feel at home. So there, these are usually decorated in child-friendly colors and designs with cartoon characters and, and so on. And uh, some, some of the facilities obviously will have some kind of um, play areas for those kids, you know, then the early stages where they still play with toys, obviously toys that are safe for their, for, for their uh, particular age and, um, and so on. So it's important that, um, that we understand that we are catering, catering to, to a different kind of, um, of uh, demographics. We're not working with adults in our, you know, adults, adults, um, adults, uh, uh, our rooms are very adult, like they're very boring. The, the colors are pretty dull. They're more calm. They're not as bright. So the design of these rooms are specifically catered to, to, uh, to these, these demographics to kids, right? They, they want to get their attention. They want to engage them with the environment so they can feel a little bit in home life and not so much a, a hospital setting where it's adults, where it's a bit more depressing. So obviously adults don't have a play area, uh, usually very just a bed and maybe another chair. Uh, accommodations are also made for adults. Uh, obviously the parents that are going through this uh, will feel the compelled to spend time with the child at, at least for a part of the day. So most of these facilities will allow 
is hospitals, um, they'll allow the parents to be able to stay with the kids. So they, they usually uh, leave them a, a type of um, uh, a couch or recliner or bed so that they can room in with the child so that the child doesn't experience too much separation anxiety. Uh, these units are also uh, offer uh, courtesy trays, meal trays to the parents as they are the primary caregivers. They're, you know, they're extended that courtesy to, you know, to offer a meal to them. So that way um, they can eat with their child and the child can uh, adapt a little bit easier to their new situation in the, in the hospital. So meals are usually uh, uh, also uh, uh, given to, to parents. So again, uh, the whole idea of these uh, facilities is to allow parents to, to obviously not only spend time with, with the child, but to take into, into consideration the stages of development of the child, all right? If you remember a, in the very first stages from zero to one, a child uh, who is a few months old has not yet developed trust in, in adults. So they're barely getting to know their parents. Now they trust the parents, so they develop that trust with that person. But once they meet someone else who is not their parent, they may feel that anxiety and start crying and, and so on, and it becomes very difficult. Uh, we may not see it, but these children may actually experience uh, a lot of emotional trauma that we quite don't understand yet because the child can't tell us. But the child does experience a lot of that. Uh, and we, we don't see it, but they need a lot of um, attention from their primary uh, parent for this reason. All right, uh, so what are the effects on a child during hospitalization? How, um, what happens to them? What, what is going through their mind uh, as they're being admitted into the facility, staying there and, and maybe perhaps not even uh, seeing their parents uh, all the time. What uh, they do go through is that they go through stages of uh, emotional um, trauma. Uh, what the first one being protest. The child will start to protest. Obviously, we see the child's behavior right away, crying, uh, refusing to, to be comforted by others. You know, we try and, and grab them and, and, and hug them and, and uh, try to, to explain to them. But uh, at this point, usually the children does not understand that emotional, right? They don't understand that, well, I'm sick and I have to be here. They, they don't understand that yet because of their uh, the stage of development. So a child will go through this stage of protest, right? Initially when they're first admitted because they don't want to be separated from the loved one. Despair, uh, after a short while, especially if the parent does leave the facility, you know, perhaps they have to work. Uh, or have other obligations with other children, they have to leave that child in the hospital. And the child will feel despair, they're withdrawn, they will separate themselves from, from the parent, from the staff, they'll be very quiet, they don't wanna engage, they don't, may not want to eat, you know, they don't wanna participate in, 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 in the care, obviously. So they become very depressed and almost this is like they're not there, okay? So this again, emotional, uh, changes that are occurring in the child who doesn't quite yet understand what's going on. So we as adults, it's difficult for us to see that and understand what is going through the mind because obviously we don't understand their, their developing minds. But all these subtle, we may think it, you know, small um, experiences for them. To them, it may be a life-lasting experience. We don't, we don't know because we don't understand that yet. So despair, protest, you know, the child cries and refuses to be comforted. Uh, they will be looking for mom and dad going, walking there, crying, and, and perhaps even doing tantrums, depending on what stage of their of development they're at. So they're out there. And it doesn't, this can happen not only in the hospital, it occurs even in daycare. You drop off your kids at daycare. Initially, the child doesn't understand why you're leaving them there. They, they're thinking you don't love them anymore. And you know, and so on. So they don't get that. So they start doing this, you know, behaviors. Despair is the first stage. Later they go with a, I'm sorry, protest. And then later they move on to despair where they're just they're sitting quiet, not doing anything, not participating. They, they still don't want to, you know, engage with other people because they feel like you just dumped them there and uh, you don't care for them and so on. Okay. And this may continue even after you pick them up, let's say daycare 
or somewhere, uh, they may be mad at you, all right? And this is part of the despair process. So all these emotional changes are going to the child, you know, just because, you know, you took them to daycare or because they're hospitalized or whatever the case may be. Uh, the next phase of, is uh, denial. The child seems to be feeling better uh, about the situation, but, and takes interest in surroundings. Uh, she may interact with us a little bit more. Uh, when the caregiver arrives, they will re reject you. Okay, so now you're the bad parent. Okay, the child recognizes this. They have emotions. They're developing these emotions. And if you think about it, every time we do this with them, they, they, they develop something new. Right, they, they're adapting to this change, hopefully positive, but still they know that they're going to be upset at you. They're going to reject you because they think you're a bad person, a bad parent, a bad mom, dad, and so on. So uh, this, now hopefully you can understand why kids behave the way they do. Right? It's not uh, so much because they want to misbehave or they want to you know, act out it's because these emotional changes are, are making you know, um, a, an impact in their mind. So again, these are the three changes that you'll see with the child protest, despair, and denial in a healthcare facility, hospital, specialty hospital, and so on. So we have to understand what the child is going through, all right? We can't be um, uh, you know, judging the, the child, oh, well, this is a spoiled kid. You know, he's, he's not used to get, you know, being separated from mommy, and now he's crying. These are normal, normal behaviors that we should understand that we'll be seeing in a, in a child, regardless if it's a, in a one, two, three, four, five year old, they all kind of go through the same, although they adapt differently. Again, they may, um, they may also have more experiences like this from other people. So this is, uh, this, it's gonna vary on a child depending on their past life experiences. If they went through that before, I mean, the second time they go to the hospital, they may react you know, less, you know, uh, less seriously than the first time. Okay, what are some of the fears uh, or some of the things that, um, how does a child's hospitalization affect the family? Well, a hospitalization, especially in the culture, is, a, is a, a family affair. Everybody is affected by it. Okay, not just um, emotionally, you're separated from your child, but uh, you have a lot of other things, right? You have your your work, you have other children have to go to school and, and so on. So the, the impact of a, a child's hospitalization can be, can be you know, um, different, okay? Uh, if you're a mom and you have a child and they, something, they get sick or whatever, you may feel that maybe you're not doing your job right, okay? You're, you didn't do something, so you may, uh, you may blame yourself for something that happened to your child, okay? If it's an accident, or something that just the child just develops, you may feel that you're, you know, you're not adequate enough, or you're, um, you're not uh, doing your job correctly. All right, uh, we have to encourage the family okay, to stay with the child and participate in the child's um, development in the hospital or the child stay, because if if not, you know, I think it's harsher, more difficult on both people not only the child, but also the, the caregiver, the parent, whoever it may be, uh, because this is, a, this is a, a family. But remember, we're not just um, a, a, a one thing person. We are holistic people. We need psychological development, emotional development, physical, physiological, and so on. So our family is part of our psychosocial development and uh, the family is part of their uh, social, psychosocial development. Rather, the child is part of the family. So. It's, you know, it's a, it's a circle, it's a cycle, and we all have to be part of it. Uh, so we need to encourage the family as much as, as possible to participate in the care. Stress, not to mention stress, can be a, you know, go up, you know, because of the, the situation. It, the hospitalization is very stressful, not knowing what may happen to your child is one thing, uh, but everything else that is affected, including your job, your schedule, Everything is, is, you know, thrown off because of the, you know, your child being in the hospital. So it takes a big toll uh, stress-wise uh, to every family, to every family member, the mom, the dad, and so on. So we need to be very, uh, very careful with, with the family. Uh, we have to be very empathetic, you know, understand what they're going through. 
and uh, put yourself in their position. How would you feel if you're caring, if you have a child in the hospital? I know nobody wants to have a child in the hospital, right, unless they really have to be. So we have to be very understanding, very understanding uh, of what goes on there and not, not start to judge them, you know, because there will be a lot of different kinds of parents that you're going to see in. It's, it's difficult to see uh, families go through this, okay? And some families go through this very often because the child may be a sickly child. They're always in the hospital and they may, uh, you know, some kind of a, uh, cancer, leukemias or whatever. So they're frequently in the hospital. And uh, at times it may seem like the parents are, you know, not there all the time anymore, you know, they don't care anymore, but that's not the case, you know? Uh, we still have to keep on providing for other families and so on. So at times the child may be left alone for a period of time. It doesn't mean that the parents don't care anymore. So again, just be understanding with them. Uh, facilities uh, will have counselors. I'm sure they have child counselors and family counselors in general that can attend to the psychological, psychosocial needs of both the, the patient, the pediatric child, uh, pediatric patient, but also the family. Okay, because again, this is a family ordeal. This is not just a, a pediatric patient. So if you've gone through this situation, you can relate very easily, uh, even if it's, uh, you know, just a quick ER visit or, you know, one or two day hospitalization. But think about those families that have kids that have to endure, you know, long hospitalizations, so week to weeks, even months. So that can be very, very difficult in families. Everything is set aside, put on hold, uh, because of this child needs, you know, their, their attention. So again, let's just be very understanding. All right, what are the, some of the fears of the hospital's child? What is going through the mind? Again, we're thinking emotionally, right? Emotional, uh, things that are having. Uh, the child will probably experience some kind of pain at some point during the hospitalization, especially if we have to uh, uh, place any IV uh, needles in them. They don't understand what that is. Uh, they're gonna experience pain. How do they experience pain? Again, it's going to determine at what stage of development they are. They may see pain as something, you know, uh, as like a punishment. Okay, if you're, you know, putting a needle in them, they don't think, well, oh, it's uh, I have a a needle in my arm because because uh, I need it for IV therapy. They don't understand that. They think that you're punishing them, right? Or they're there because they misbehaved or or whatever else. You know, what I, we don't know what's going on through the mind, but we do know that. Uh, they, they don't quite understand, they have, don't have the concept of pain, okay? A child who has experienced a painful procedure in the past will expect future procedures to be painful as well. Uh, if, uh, if we uh, discipline our kids, you know, with uh, physical punishment, you know, we, in our culture, you know, we have different ways of, of doing that. And if, the, if your child is in the hospital and they're getting, experiencing pain, they may see it as similar to that, to the punishment that they get at home to the punishment that they're getting at the hospital. So we always have to be uh, be honest to the child and explain what, you know, that is gonna hurt and tell them what to expect. Uh, you know, to a certain degree, they will understand. But from there on, if you cause pain to that child, believe me, they're, they're gonna see you every time as someone who causes pain and they're not gonna like you. Uh, unfortunately, that's, that's, you know, their extent of their understanding. But again, so pain is something that, that is gonna happen. They're gonna experience it and it's a fear. They already know. They see nurses, they see doctors and a lot of children cry. And sometimes parents are, are guilty of, you know, labeling um, the healthcare providers as like a, um, a person that causes pain, right? We turn them, look, if you misbehave, I'm gonna tell the nurse. If you misbehave, I'm gonna call, you know, the doctor or whatever. So they see us as bad people, okay? So that's not good. So uh, that's, uh, you know, something that happens a lot in our culture, at least. Punishment, punishment. Uh, a lot of young kids that are like, you know, four or five year old, maybe even the, the first graders, uh, they see uh, some of the um, procedures that are done in the in the hospitals as again another kind of punishment. You know, maybe they misbehave, they did something wrong. At this stage in life, you know, uh, preschoolers and uh, school age kids, they still live in a fantasy world. Up to about six or seven years old. They still believe in, you know, in cartoons and in fantasy worlds and all the kinds of things. That is to them that is still real. Okay, so when they come to the real world and experience things that are not from the fantasy, 
they, they don't cope with that very well. Okay, so they see that as a punishment. The child begins to learn um, actions such as misbehaving uh, uh, or consequences. Okay, the punishment or the hospitalization may be a consequence of the misbehavior. So they may start to kind of understand some of the con cognitive development that they're getting is, you know, trying to piece together the experiences that they're having, right? Uh, with the consequences that they're experiencing as well. So the child may believe that the procedure is necessary because something they did, something parents make the mistake of saying things that if, if you don't misbehave, the nurse will give you a shot. We've all heard that before, okay? We might even said it. So again, uh, the kid is uh, kind of connecting, you know, hospitalization with punishment as a consequence of their misbehaviors. So they're still kind of living in a, a, a fantasy world. They don't understand that they need this procedures, medical procedures because of health reasons. They don't quite get that yet. Uh, many uh, uh, mutilation, mutilation is um, uh, when someone is, uh, you know, uh, you get part of their, part of their body uh, cut off or, or scarred or cut or whatever. That's mutilation. So many preschoolers and school children are hospitalized fear mutilation. They might have seen things. Remember, they live in a fantasy world and if they see something uh, in, on television, especially, okay, now with our, everything that's available to them, they, they see and they might expect something like that happen to them. Okay, they, don't, they cannot separate what they saw on TV with the real world. So they're afraid of being mutilate, uh, mutilated, okay, or cut up or, or done had procedures on them and so on that they might have seen. So this is again a part of their fantasy uh, world. They have a lot of imagination. And they may be afraid of being in the hospital for this reason. So these are again some of the fears that they're experiencing. So how do we deal with that? Uh, a lot of times we have to um, role play using um, either a teddy bear or some kind of toy and try to experience, a, um, kind of simulate the experience, you know, with a child and, and their toys so they can understand, right? Uh, their fantasy world is still very alive. Their imagination is very well alive. So it's difficult for them to understand a surgical procedure. So again, mutilation is something that the child um, makes uh, fear because of what they've seen on television, not necessarily because they understand what it is. Not an, an older school child or even an adolescent may worry that the procedure will alter the experience. So by then the childs are already getting a little bit more, um, uh, what's the word, a conscious about their appearance. So if they're gonna get a procedure, especially in the face, they're gonna be worrying about how they're gonna look. If they get a, a surgical procedure, they're gonna leave a scar. You know, am I going to be able to wear a bathing suit? You know, this is something my adolescent might worry about. A young child doesn't worry about that because they're not conscious about their body. But as they get older, they start to develop more conscious. So again, it depends the stage of development that they are uh, and how they're going to perceive this hospitalization, the fears, and so on. So death, um, death is a concept, an idea, right? We as adults see death as the last stage of life, a natural process. Okay, we fear yes, we fear death, but children don't understand that. They, they still don't understand that, you know, they can die. They may think that people go to sleep. And a lot of times we tell our kids, well, you know, uh, grandpa went with, you know, with God or he's sleeping and so on. They don't understand that. They just think they're actually sleeping. Okay, so uh, death is not a concept, an idea that they understand until usually about seven years old or older. That's when they start to understand what actually happens when a person dies. So hospital might have been, uh, been going there to visit someone who later died. Grandpa died in the hospital. I understand that. The child may also have been told that someone who died went to sleep and never woke up. Or someone with the angels, they went with the angels. Okay. Again, it's, um, it's uh, something that you can't really explain to a, a little kid. Okay, they, they're not going to get it unless they're already old enough to understand Remember, um, fantasy world and real world. If they've already, they're seven years old and they know that, you know, superheroes are cartoons, well, they can pretty much understand that death is, is the last part of, dying, of life, right? So 
uh, again, death is something uh, that they may fear after they're seven years old. You know, if they're undergoing a, a if they have a condition that obviously affects their their um, their life and the you know their social life and their normal life. Of course, it's going to affect their psychological as well. All right. So, so those are some of the fears that kids experience during the during their uh, hospitalizations. Most hospitalized children separated from their families, caregivers go through which of the following three stages? What are the three stages of hospitalized children? Protest, despair, and denial. Those are the three stages that they go through. Protest, despair, and denial. Child's illness or injury, especially if it results in the need of hospitalization, uh, is very stressful for the child and the family. It's a family affair, not just about the kid, but the whole family. Of course, if they have siblings, they're also going to be affected by the hospitalization. Be worried about their siblings, brother, sister, and so on. Um, everybody is affected. So how do we deal with kids uh, when they're in the hospital? How can we help them cope, you know, adapt a little bit easier uh, to their situation? Well, we do a lot of role play, okay? Uh, play is what they do. When they're, you know, they're very young, one toddlers, two, three-year-old kids, even up to seven-year-olds. Uh, maybe nowadays, I don't know how much they play, but they, 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 it's what they do. You know, if they're watching a video on, on, on their, on their, uh, you know, phone device or whatever, they, they, that's their playtime. Okay, they're, they're living there in their fantasy world. Okay, and we try to help them. Uh, again, live their normal life in the hospital. We try to help them continue that in the hospital. That way they, they don't feel as, as isolated, separated, or whatever uh, when they're in the hospital. So we offer them toys. Uh, toys, obviously, to help them also assimilate the role that they're having in the hospital. So if a, a child is going to have a surgical procedure uh, because they have a, you know, a condition, of the heart or, or, or whatever the reason they'll, you know, they, we show them dolls, you know, with, with the body parts. And so they can help start to understand what is going on with their body. But again, it, it's, it's, it's not easy to help them go through that transition. Uh, children use play to help them learn, to grow and develop, act out their feelings and work their problems. So when you see your child um, playing, when they're, playing by themselves, they're playing with the toys, and you see them, you know, doing their thing, okay? They're actually doing things, you know? They're simulating things that they see out there in the real world, okay? So they see a car, they know that a car moves around, and they move the little car back and forth, and it goes here and there, up and down, and they're kind of simulating whatever they're seeing in the real world. So that's what that's what they do, and that's how they, um, that's how they're able to to understand the world up to their to the level of understanding. Um, central activities or the, you know the facilities have um, areas designated for for kids to play, uh, sometimes in group play with other kids and so on, uh, if their condition allows. Uh, so every uh, play area is is age appropriate. They might have different sections for different ages, stage groups, and so on. So uh, again, hospitals try to make it as as kid. Uh, friendly as possible, so that they can again continue to to um, to to live their life. Okay, depending on the stage uh, uh, where they are, age-appropriate toys, activities, you know, movies, whatever it is that they that they like to do, they try to provide for them. Now we do what we call therapeutic play. Therapeutic, therapeutic play. It's a technique that we use a lot with the, with the kids. Again. To help them understand and cope with the condition and what's going to go, what they're going to go through, uh, what's going to happen, and so on. Okay, so we use again uh, toys because that's what they can uh, mostly identify with, right? In their in their in their play world, so we use these toys to help them understand. You know, we put a bandaid on a little teddy bear or, or gauze or things like that, or an IV, and so on. So now they can understand that, okay? And uh, hopefully they can assimilate that what's going to happen to them as well. All right, uh, pain and the pediatric patient. Pain, again, is something that we have to be very uh, aware about because 
once a, um, a person, a, a child experiences pain, uh, they're going to label that person or that object as, as, um, as painful, okay, it's a bad thing or usually a bad thing. So we have to assess the children. We have to look at the children and evaluate uh, their, their, their reaction to pain. Many children will not complain of pain because they're afraid that if they complain that they're gonna get more pain, okay? Uh, which is usually not um, a healthy response, okay? Not considered a good response. Uh, younger children may not have the vocabulary they need to be able to explain where the pain is. So we have to use, you know, very um, specific words to explain to them what pain is, you know, and uh, uh, to their age level, right? An ouchie or uh, 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 little uh, uh, sting, like a bee sting or something like that. Things that they can identify with, maybe a little ant bite or, you know, something that they can understand. Um, look at their facial expressions and behaviors that indicate pain. Their facial expression is going to tell you a lot. So that's why we use um, the, the faces uh, pain rating scale. Kids won't tell you or can't tell you because they don't have the word the vocabulary. But if you look at their face, you can use that face pain scale to, to measure their pain. Okay, and we have to document it. Okay, now the child can understand a little bit, you know, maybe a three or four year old child, and they can understand does it hurt a little bit? Does it hurt a little bit more, a lot, or whatever they say? That's that is what we need to document. Um, of course, toddlers a little bit, you know, uh, more dramatic. You know, toddlers they, they want to be in control, they want to be uh, everywhere. You know, uh, if they want something, they want things done their way and so on. So toddlers may be more uh, reactive to, to pain. They may show it more obviously, okay? And why? Because they're trying to tell you, I don't want pain. So they're gonna overreact to the pain. And this is why sometimes uh, when you try to discipline your kids and you haven't even physically disciplined yet and they're already crying, it's not that they're, you know, that they're crying because it's gonna hurt. It's, it's, they're trying to be over dramatic so that you you can maybe have compassion for them and not discipline physically. So this is a game that they do. They're they're smart and they they know that if they overreact, perhaps you're not going to discipline them. Okay, so these toddlers are you know they're very uh, catchy, they're very smart, and they're trying to get you to do things how they want them to be done, not how you want them to be done. So again, older children are more likely to be able to use verbal statements. Um, when discussing pain with younger children, uh, use words that are uh, they're familiar with, such as a, a boo boo or uh, you know an owie, ouchie, whatever things like that. These are probably more for like you know three, four, five year old kids that already understand some vocabulary. If you think that one of your uh, patients is in pain, you should report it to the nurse immediately. Again, how do you know that they're in pain? Look at their facial expressions. That should tell you pretty much it. Again, remember the stages, right? The stages. Um, of uh, the kid goes through the ones we talked about, protest, despair, denial. You know, we may see them withdrawn and sad or, you know, that not certain they're in pain, but we know that they're going through, through that as well. So uh, repositioning, using supporting devices can help improve comfort. Many, many, many children are soothed by a massage or a gentle touch or, or maybe, you know, using a, like again, a role play, using another toy to, to explain to them and so on. So use whatever methods works for that child at that specific stage, okay? So there are the challenging here part is that children are at every, you know, they may be the same age, but they may be at a different stage of development. So that becomes very, very challenging. Challenging. What is the role, okay? Uh, what is the role of nursing assistants, patient care technicians uh, when you care for a child, okay? Again, Consider the development stage of the child. There, there are some videos on, on YouTube or uh, other books that you can look into. Uh, as a matter of fact, in, in, in nursing, when we, when we're, uh, in the, in the, we get trained, there's one course, which is one semester long, uh, that focuses completely on children. And we don't want to just focus on the physical development of the child, but the cognitive development of the child the, um, the emotional development of the child, 
okay? So are, is their my brain developing correctly, you know, through every stage in life? Are they emotionally developing, you know, or growing healthy? So we, as, you know, we look at their emotional development, their nutrition development. However, we look at the whole kid, okay? We look at the whole child and uh, address their needs, again, according to Maslow's hair care needs, you know, are they eating well? Are they eliminating well? Are they drinking? So food and water or elimination are very important in the Maslow's hair care needs. And they're the same for, for every human being. So we assess the child, you know, according to their uh, developmental stage, uh, their nutrition, are they eating well? Very, very important. If we don't eat, uh, then we cannot recover. So nutrition is very, very important. Uh, elimination, uh, assist with procedures. If a nurse is going to uh, place an IV on a person, uh, a child, you may have to hold, you know, assist with holding the child. Preferably the, the caregiver should be the one, but if not, then uh, uh, patient care would be the one. Uh, restraints are sometimes used with kids because they like to, uh, you know, remove things like IVs and things like that, or they may try to, you know, crawl out of the crib or jump out of the crib or something like that. They may have to be restrained at some point. So you might have to either hold them down or, or use another kind of restraint. Uh, transportation, obviously, if kids that need to go to radiology or another department within the facility, uh, you would be the one to, to take them here and there. So again, let's go back to nutrition, okay? Nutrition is very, very important. Um, it may be one of the, probably the most important, if not the most important thing, that we need to look into the child, okay? If they're in the hospital, they're not just there to get medications or medical treatment. They also need to be fed. Um, they need to eat. We need to encourage them. You know, some children can be very, very picky about what they eat. Uh, if they're not good eaters, it becomes very challenging. So we have to, you know, pretty much sit down and talk to them and ask them and, and uh, you know, ask the caregiver, what is it they like to eat, you know, even before they leave, because then after that, it's really difficult to get them to eat, there's these picky eaters. Uh, if the child doesn't have any dietary restrictions, caregivers may be encouraged to bring their favorite foods and snacks as long as you know it's within their this therapeutic diet. So we have to be familiar with the therapeutic diet. What is it? What can they eat? Or maybe they're going to be MPO, nothing by mouth. You're going to have a procedure done, so they can't eat or drink for now. So again, we have to be familiar with the care plan. What's going on with this child? Uh, what, what is? Uh, what are they going to get done? So again, assisting with nutrition is super, super important. A lot of the sick children also uh, often have a, uh, are dehydrated you know, and they need to increase more oral, uh, oral fluids. Sometimes we, uh, we, do, we don't just give them water. We, you know, we usually encourage them to drink anything but you know, water, maybe juices, whatever it is that they like to drink. Okay? As long as it's usually not carbonated drinks like sodas and things like that. Um, but uh, anyhow, uh, children like popsicles, ice cream, gelatins, anything that can turn into a liquid form uh, is considered a, a fluid. So something we have to really look at the, at the hydration status. When you see a child that's you know, just pretty much sitting and their eyes, this part of the eyes gets sunken into, that means they're dehydrated. If we look at their tongue and it looks really dry, that means they're dehydrated. So we have to pay attention to these little things because yeah, we record everything that, you know, that uh, the child eats so we have to report any any um, any any uh, meals that are, are less than 50%. If the children, you know, they don't eat a lot, and 50% can be very very small amount and not enough to keep them well nourished, so they will not recover. Okay, so again, this is probably one of the most challenging aspects to care for a child to get them to eat. Okay, remember all those phases. Okay, protest, despair, and denial. If they're still in a protest mode. They're not going to be eating anything anytime soon. So that increases the risk of them getting dehydrated, you know, and getting IV therapy, which you know complicates the problem. So attending to their needs, very, very important. Uh, if you look at um, page 38 on table 11.1, look at that table. It's very, very helpful for you to understand not only uh, patients, but also your own children if you have any, so that you can um, be better prepared to understand. The, the stages of development. Now, elimination, uh, obviously some kids, you know, very young kids, uh, you know, they still haven't uh, learned to potty train. So they require a diaper change. Even if they do have uh, diaper changes, we don't just change them out and throw away the diapers. 
uh, we have to document, you know, how much they, they eliminate either bowel movements. Is it, a, uh, is it a small amount? Is it a large amount? Is it, you know, is it soft or is it hard? Um, we weigh the diapers, especially on little babies, you know, up to maybe one or two years old. We weigh the diapers, we put them on a little scale. Why? Because it tells how much they're, they're putting out, you know, versus how much they're drinking. So we have to, the dog, you know, the doctor has to find a balance. We don't want them to get dehydrated. So we have to weigh the diapers and document it along with your, uh, with your, uh, with the bowel movements. <clears throat> if they can, they go in a potty chair, okay, in a bedpan or, or any collection device if they're already able to control their, their sphincters. We try to remind families to not dispose of urine until uh, we've had a chance to observe the urine. We want to know how much they urinated that way we can report it. Um, so measuring urinary output is very, very important, very important because it tells you, tells us the hydration status of the child. Assisting with procedures, again, you may be responsible to help physician or hold the child for a procedure. It may be an injection, it may be a medication that we have to give them, oral medication, or it may be an IV or whatever, you may have to assist with them. Um, do not uh, react to any, any aggression toward, from a child. Maybe it's a toddler to a three-year-old, you're trying to hold them and they bite you or, or they kick you, whatever. Obviously, this is a child that don't understand that behavior. Remember, try to be empathetic, uh, understand what it is that they're going through. Restraints, uh, we don't try to use restraints hardly at all anymore. Um, those boards they put on their arm so that they don't bend the arm, is, they're meant to keep an IV in place and so on. But uh, it is considered restraint because it limits the, the movement of the arm. Uh, these over restraints are very common, okay, very common. Uh, jacket restraints sometimes for the kids that are really, really aggressive, and we have a lot of trouble uh, giving any kind of treatment for them. They may be, they may be uh, use some kind of a, a jacket restraint. We don't use restraints like in adults, like the wrist restraints or the ankle restraints, things like that, because because that would cause serious circulation problems. So a, a vest or jacket would be more appropriate for them or safer. Uh, if needed, okay. And these are used obviously as a last resort. We don't, you know, it's not the first thing we do. Uh, thank goodness. So transporting a child, uh, transporting a child from one place to another, another may be your job. Either take them to radiology for a procedure, or another department where they need to care for the child. That will be within your scope. So transporting a child uh, again may be a two, three-year-old, and maybe a 10-year-old child in a wheelchair. So again, um, this is another part of your job assisting with transports. Common disorders in the child. What are some of the common things that we see? Congenital disorders. These are disorders that kids are born with. Uh, they're born with this uh, condition, and we have to understand them. What is it? How do they? How does it affect the child? And, for, and how, what is the role that we have to do? How do we uh, uh, help them? So any um, any any congenital disorder may may be a a um, a, a type of malformation. Maybe they have a, a what they call a cleft palate when they have the lip, you know, their upper lip sunken in like that, or maybe um, uh, maybe they're born blind or they're they're born without a limb or whatever. That's congenital anomaly. Uh, that happens a lot, very common, especially the cleft lip and palate, where the, the inner uh, palate is um, not formed and their lip sinks in, and but that can be corrected later. But again, that's one of the most common things that you'll see. Trauma, of course, from injuries, fractures, traumatic brain injuries, and so on. Uh, it happens from accidents, and you see those a lot. Uh, fractures, you know, the fracture of the arm or the leg. Uh, infectious diseases are also pretty common in kids, especially the respiratory diseases. You have to be familiar with those. Uh, and we'll talk about them in a, in a few minutes. Chronic illnesses and developmental disabilities. Chronic illnesses like maybe diabetes. Some kids are born with diabetes uh, that, where they require insulin injections and so on. So you have to know a little bit about diabetes as well. Uh, cystic fibrosis, which is another common one. Asthma, uh, bronchitis. Uh, arthritis in some kids, it becomes very, very difficult for them. And of course, cancers, these become chronic because they have to, um, it affects their whole body and they have to be returned to hospitals very often. It becomes a chronic condition. 
Now, what you will find a lot, and you have to be familiar with our respiratory disorders. These are very, very common. Uh, children's immune system is not well developed yet. Uh, so they're uh, obtaining uh, immunity through direct contact, right? So if they're exposed, um, understand that like in the daycares, uh, a lot of the kids that go to daycare get very sickly because they're exposed to kids that are sick and then they catch it. And then another kid gets sick and then they catch it again. So it becomes kind of like a cycle because a lot of these kids are, are not, um, are not uh, do not have a well-developed immune system. So every other kid gets sick and then passes it on to the next one. It becomes like a cycle. So respiratory diseases are one of the most common ones. Um, <clears throat> bronchiolitis or bronchio bronchitis, they call it. Uh, the bronchioles, um, they're the very small part of your respiratory system. They become inflamed and uh, they produce a lot of phlegm and you can hear the little chest congestion and so on. Uh, it makes it very difficult for them to, to breathe. Right, so the, the, the children may start to have breathing problems. They may have uh, what's called wheezing, where their airway becomes very tight. Uh, they may require, um, uh, very commonly we see uh, those uh, uh, nebulizers, you know, those machines that put out a little mist, medications that help the, the airways relax and open up and, and help them expectorate a lot of this mucus that develops. So respiratory uh, RSV is one of the most common uh, things that you'll see in the hospitals in the pediatric units. Uh, because RSV is caused by virus antibiotics are not effective, uh, antibiotics do not cure viruses. Just like here, we have the COVID-19 virus. We have a treatment now, apparently there's a vaccine, but uh, a lot of uh, vaccines are, 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 I'm sorry, antibiotics are not good for, for viruses. Okay, so if you get the flu viruses, antibiotics do not really help you, okay? Antibiotics are more for bacterial infections. So, hold on. Okay, so, so RV, again, it's a very common condition and you should be familiar with it, understand it, uh, how it affects the child and it's a breathing problem and it become very uh, serious because uh, it, you know, if left untreated, the child can actually develop uh, severe breathing problems, you know, maybe even go into respiratory failure. So learn uh, more to that what RSV is. How it's treated, we, we treat more of the symptoms like the breathing problem, we give uh, inhalation treatments, we give oxygen and so on. So very, very uh, important that you know that croup is a, it's a, a type of respiratory problem as well. Croup, though, is caused by bacterial infection. So antibiotics are, are good uh, to treat croup, we call it. Uh, it can be viral, bacterial, but it affects more the upper respiratory system, not so much the bronchioles, which is a lower respiratory infection, but more like your bronchus, you know, up here. It's kind of more like a, uh, you call it, a, we call it upper respiratory infections. Uh, you might call it like a sore throat, you know, it's considered croup. But if they have symptoms like wheezing, where their airway is tight, Okay, they have a you know phlegm, they're expectorating, they may even have a fever, then we call it croup. So croup is more like an uh, upper respiratory infection. Usually affects uh, kids uh, one year to three year olds, usually. A child with croup will have a harsh bark-like cough and difficulty breathing. So that bark-like cough should be the, the telltale sign of a child who has croup. Epiglottitis or inflammation of your epiglottis. Your epiglottis is a very small uh, valve that closes off your airway. So when you're drinking water, your epiglottis close, closes so that way water won't go into your airway. Well, sometimes this epiglottis gets inflamed. It makes it very difficult to speak because you know when you're breathing, you're, when you're talking, you're pushing air out and your epiglottis is swollen. It doesn't open as easily, so it makes it difficult to to, um, to speak. So mostly caused by H influenza, which is the common flu, causes inflammation of the epiglottis. Um, again, it's, uh, it is treatable with uh, antibiotics. It's not that serious because it mostly affects them, the speaking, but yes, the breathing to some degree because it can open as easily as, uh, as it should. Asthma, of course, we know asthma is a closing of your airway. 
not just your bronchus, but maybe your left and bron uh, bronchioles or smaller branches, they get um, irritated by either dry air or like, you know, the weather changes, dust or something triggers your, uh, your, bronchi your bronchus and your bronchioles to, to close, making it very difficult for you to breathe because your airway is not that big. And by closing, makes it very difficult for you to breathe. So asthma is something that we need to understand what it is. You know, obviously it's closing of your airway. Sometimes they produce a lot of mucus. Okay, so what do we do? We usually uh, administer uh, emergency inhalers. A lot of the children that suffer from asthma carry an inhaler, which of course they use. Um, they use, you know, they give themselves one or two inhalation treatments and it usually goes away. If it doesn't go away, obviously the, uh, we have to call them one more or they have to be admitted into the hospital. So asthma is a chronic condition. It doesn't go away, but at times it can be managed very well. They may never have a, an asthma attack for a long period of time, but many times it does come back and it stays with them for, for the rest of their life. So they, they're depending on these inhalation uh, therapies. The child has uh, recently had an asthma attack um, and you know, when they had trouble breathing, they get worried. Um, they check on, you know, the parents check on their kid, uh, you know, often. And the child obviously, you know, they learn how to manage this problem. So if they, a lot of times they become afraid of, of uh, getting um, or uh, participating in a lot of activities because they know that they may get an attack. So it, it becomes difficult for them to, to live almost a normal childhood. Okay, they can live a normal childhood, you know, to a certain degree uh, because of the fear of uh, asthma attacks. Now, cystic fibrosis is one of those congenital problems um, that affects the exocrine glands. So we have glands all over our body, right? And they secrete either mucus or saliva or something, okay? These exocrine glands are everywhere in the body, but kids that are born with cystic fibrosis are often um, uh, develop a lot of mucus in their lungs. So in the lungs, we shouldn't have mucus. Uh, we do have a little bit, but usually we expectorate it, right? It moves out. But these kids that have cystic fibrosis, they produce too much mucus in the lungs, impairing their, their gas exchange, okay? So instead of having them exchange gas, uh, oxygen, pick up oxygen, get rid of CO2, some of these kids are unable to do that because of the, of the excessive mucus that exists in there. So they do develop respiratory problems, uh, usually a few years after they're born, and they end up usually with what we call it a tracheostomy. Remember we spoke about tracheostomy care the other day. So kids that have a tracheostomy usually uh, may be because they have cystic fibrosis, okay? So again, what is cystic fibrosis? It's, uh, it's uh, excessive mucus uh, produced by these glands, they call it exocrine, gl exocrine glands. Exocrine means to excrete out. Right, so uh, this is what happens, and uh, it blocks the airway. Uh, they cannot exchange gases, and here we have a, a respiratory issue caused by cystic fibrosis. Now, cardiovascular disorders are common, but not too common. My goodness, um, they uh, they can affect a child. A lot of kids um, that have uh, cardiovascular problems, uh, some of them can can live almost a normal life uh, life. I had a student who had a, an example uh, with what's called tetralogy of phthalate, which is covered in this, in this chapter. Um, he had all these, you know, his heart, you know, the anatomy of the heart was just completely different than what we expect to see. He was born with all these problems and yet he was still able to participate in sports, right? Because of the uh, medical procedures that are done nowadays, uh, they're very well advanced in this kind of treatment. And this child or this young man was actually able to live a normal lifestyle. So, what are some of the some of the uh, common problems that we see? Are septal anomalies? Uh, the septum is part of your your heart that separates your ventricles, the bottom part of your of your heart. So, in the septum, we have a little area called the the, the foramen ovale. It's a little opening that doesn't close. Um, until a few days or weeks after the child was born. Sometimes this, this little opening doesn't close and we call it a patent foramen ovale. If, what this happens is that 
some of the some of the um, oxygenated blood may get thrown into your into the right atrium. Okay, so we have the right and the left atrium. The right atrium uh, pushes blood to the lungs to pick up oxygen, comes back to the left atrium. So if there's a little opening in between those two chambers, then blood that has oxygen and comes back to the right. What may happen is that the child may become short of breath or have less oxygen, right? Um, so normally this foramen of valve closes in about a day or two after they're born, but some kids go on longer and they may actually require a surgical procedure to undergo a surgical procedure so they can have this little um, opening close up surgically by uh, pediatricians uh, that specialize in cardiology. So that is actually a fixable problem uh, that is common, okay? And uh, again, they can, they can tell if a, uh, a baby has this problem by listening to the heart, okay? But uh, the specialist will do that. Ventricular septal defect, the septum that separates the ventricles fails to form properly causing ventricular septal defect, okay? So this could be obviously be a, a, a serious problem. <clears throat> some are small and some are larger. Uh, small ventricular defects don't require uh, treatment, but larger ones do, okay? This, this ha has to be done when they get older, okay? Depending on the severity of the defect. Uh, most kids can live an almost normal lifestyle, uh, you know, because they're just growing, growing. They're not very physically active. They don't, you know, it doesn't affect them as much, but as soon, soon as they start running around and all that, you know, it, hopefully by two years old, they, this problem should be fixed. The um, disorders of the great vessels, which is your aorta, your superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, but more so the, your aorta, which is the one that carries the oxygen for the, uh, for the, for the children, right, for the body. Okay, your, uh, the condition called patent ductus, Arteriosis uh, connects the left pulmonary artery to the aorta. So the left pulmonary artery is the, uh, the artery that, uh, that brings oxygenated blood. Okay, this is connected with the aorta, uh, which of course your, I'm sorry, your pulmonary arteries carry deoxygenated blood and your aorta has oxygenated blood. So again, a mix of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood is not good. So it's important that you understand what happens in a child that has um, this problem, this patent ductus arteriosus. Uh, this ductus arteriosus should close normally by itself, but in some cases it doesn't. It stays open resulting in this condition called patent ductus arteriosus. This oxygenated blood uh, you know, from the aorta goes into your lungs, okay? And it causes a deficiency in the circulation of the, of the patient, uh, you know, affecting the child's ability to breathe normally, especially if they become already more active. So many children grow to adulthood with a disorder and don't usually have signs or symptoms, but some do. So this may be a condition that a child can live for the rest of their life. Uh, we have the co-arctation co of the aorta, co-arctation. So the aorta, is it's kind of built like an, an arch, okay? It's narrowing of the aorta shortly after it leaves the, the left ventricle. So when your aorta starts to, you know, it's connected to your left ventricle and it starts to, to leave, it gets narrowed, okay? A narrow aorta can cause problems such as hypertension because a more narrow aorta increases resistance in the, um, in the ventricles, which will increase blood pressure and maybe cause a, you know, other, cardiovascular problems or deficiencies such as lack of oxygen. Because the ventricle has to work against this extra pressure to pump, time, uh, the left ventricle may pump less effectively causing left-sided heart failure. So this is a serious condition. Uh, it can be corrected. Okay, it can be corrected surgically uh, by placing like stents to open up the aorta. Uh, if not, the kid will have, uh, the child will have experiences or severe uh, symptoms like shorter of breath, they may turn blue, um, they may become tachycardic, their heart rate will be very high. So this co irritation of the aorta is uh, not a good thing, okay? And uh, there is treatment though for children nowadays. Tetralogy of phthalate is another condition. So tetra means four. Uh, tetra tetralogy of phthalate is a, um, 
a, a, a condition the child is born with. Now, this is a, a, a condition where you have four different things uh, happening to a child. So you have the narrowing of the pulmonary artery. If, remember, the pulmonary artery is the one that takes uh, the oxygenated blood to the lungs. A ventricular septal defect, which we talked about earlier, and abnormally placed aorta. and thickening of the mus muscular walls of the right ventricle. So there's a lot of problems that uh, with this heart that can potentially affect the child's uh, development because the heart is the one that pumps blood to all the body. So if blood is not pumped or you know, um, in, in no its normal cycle, obviously the child will experience this, um, the symptoms and uh, the, the prognosis or, or uh, life expectancy of the child may actually be very, very short. Uh, children with tetralogy of phthalate have a very uh, short life expectancy. They may not survive for very long. Transpositioning of the greater arteries uh, means to switch. So the pulmonary artery and the aorta are switched. If you recall, the pulmonary artery takes deoxygenated blood to the lungs. In this case, the, the aorta takes deoxygenated blood to the lungs or oxygenated blood to the lungs rather, okay? So this is a very severe problem and it has to be corrected, it has to be corrected. Uh, the left ventricle pumps oxygen rich blood into the pulmonary artery. So this is not a good thing. You don't need oxygenated blood going back to your lungs. So it's kind of like, you know, the, the blood is just going from your left ventricle where it already has oxygen back to your lungs, we're supposed to pick up oxygen, but it already has oxygen. So this is a severe problem that has to be corrected uh, surgical uh, immediately. So these are some of the cardiovascular problems that you might hear about uh, that children are born with and are very common. So these conditions can be very serious depending on the severity of the, of the anomaly. Uh, so you have to be understanding and know how to recognize some of the symptoms like the discoloration, dyspnea, or cyanosis, which is the bluish discoloration, uh, tachycardia, which is the fast heart rate. So you see the signs and you need to report these immediately. All right, so uh, we continue our conversation and in care of the pediatric um, patient. Uh, we are now going to speak about neurologic disorders, which um, are common in the pediatric child, uh, more so congenital anomalies. Again, we said congenital anomalies are those conditions that a child is born with. And one of the most common ones um, that we see are cerebral palsy, hydrocephalus, and spina bifida. These three conditions are very common and affect the, the child in, um, in a serious way because it's going to affect them. Uh, there is gonna affect their physical uh, development, um, but also their cognitive development, their ability to, to live a normal life. So we have to understand what these conditions are when we see a child with this. So cerebral palsy is something we often see a child in a wheelchair. These are often, you know, these children often live to, to young adulthood years. Uh, this is called usually by lack of uh, oxygen to the brain. It could be, uh, you know, for whatever reason, a lot of children that are born, uh, you know, with a with their umbilical cord tied around their neck as they're getting born, or they get stuck in the in the in the, in the birth canal, it, they're they're there without oxygen for a prolonged period of time. It could be a minute, two minutes. It affects the brain. So they're born with cerebral palsy. Again, it's damage caused by the cerebrum, which is the the back part of the brain. Okay, and usually the the tissue that dies is there, and it affects the brain development. Uh, so a person with cerebral palsy uh, often has trouble moving uh, parts voluntarily. A lot of their, their movement will be, you know, uh, like repetitive, like, you know, they have sudden movements and you don't understand uh, these usually is caused by uh, cerebral palsy because of the damage to the, to the cerebrum, which is the back part of the brain. Another condition we see often is also hydrocephalus. Hydro means water, cephalo means brain. So you cannot have water in your brain uh, we do have fluid in the brain. We have cerebral spinal fluid, but not water. So what happens to, to, to this person is that that excess of water causes a lot of pressure in the brain and it affects uh, their brain development. 
Sometimes they're born with cognitive impairments. They're unable to learn uh, as normally as they could have. So water in the brain is not a good thing. Uh, it could be a buildup of uh, cerebrospinal fluid or other fluid. So to relieve the pressure from the brain, uh, usually the doctors have to uh, do a, what they call a burr hole. You drill a little hole uh, in the brain to relieve the pressure temporarily, but also they have to place what they call a shunt. It's gonna be like a little drainage tube that'll run from, you know, from one side, you know, usually down to the neck and it'll drain into the abdomen where all that fluid gets reabsorbed and then eliminated. So shunts are, are you know, you can see them usually, they're kind of bumpy, they're bulky. They run through uh, the side of the head to the neck and down into the abdomen. So these are place for uh, people that are born with uh, hydrocephalus. Um, Spina bifida is another condition that you might hear about uh, where you have the, the child <clears throat> is born with a, where the lower spine, instead of being connected, okay, it's actually born, uh, they're born with the spine separated, okay? So obviously this is going to affect the lower part of their body. They are many times are unable to walk because they have no control over that, the nerves don't work. So spina bifida, it's again a congenital anomaly and uh, the vertebrae do not close, okay? The, they don't close, so they're unable to control the lower part of the body. Uh, many children that are born with the spina bifida uh, usually also had hydrocephalus or they have some other kind of congenital uh, uh, defect and they're born with all these conditions. It seems like they have all three in one, cerebral palsy, hydrocephalus, and spina bifida. They might have had uh, you know, all, all these uh, during the, the birth. Another neurologic disorder, we call it neurologic because it affects the neurologic system, but meningitis is a common um, condition that is sometimes uh, kids develop because they don't get their, their vaccines on time or they're exposed to someone that had meningitis. Meningitis is an infection of the meningia. The meningia are three layers that protect the brain from everything that, that, that goes around in your body. So if you have an example, if you have a, an infection, it doesn't necessarily go to your brain, right? Why? Because we have the meningia that are that are um, that are covering, you know, your brain and protecting it from everything else. So uh, meningitis uh, is it can be a serious infection because uh, swelling of the meningia obviously puts pressure in the brain and it causes the child to be very irritable. Uh, they get fever, headaches, and often a stiff, very stiff neck. Okay, sometimes even their eyes may be pushed up, you know, upwards because of the pressure in the brain. So they may it look like they're looking up. It's because of the pressure in the brain. Um, uh, if a child is suspected to ha have meningitis, the doctors will have to perform what they call a, um, a spinal tap. It means they have to go in through the lower part of the, um, the spine and collect cerebrospinal fluid using a, a needle and put it in through the back and aspirate some of that fluid and send it to the lab for analysis. So if a child is um, known to have uh, meningitis. Again, they're going to be in isolation because this is a contagious disease. Uh, they're going to be placed in isolation. Uh, remember, the child is going through the three stages, you know, protest, despair, denial, and everything in between. And now they're going to have this procedure done. Obviously, you're going to have to assist in holding or positioning the child uh, so that this procedure can be done. And it's a very, very uh, delicate procedure because the doctors have to, you know, puncture the spine and they don't want to accidentally injure another nerve. So the child may be sedated, they may require sedation to minimize the risk of them getting injured even more. So again, um, depending on the size of the child, you may they may be then at bedside. On adults, it's then on bedside. Uh, if it's a child, three, four year child, you know, uh, I'm pretty sure they're not gonna be cooperative for this one. So they may be uh, basically sedated so they can uh, be able to minimize the risk of injury. So traumatic brain injuries are another thing that unfortunately happens more so because of accidents. You know, they fall or car accidents, you know, just bicycle accidents and so on. Uh, traumatic brain injuries, uh, you know, when a child gets hit in the head uh, with a baseball bat or the ball or something, uh, it, it may affect the, um, it may have long-term, okay, uh, consequences because any trauma to the brain 
you know, it affects it. It causes swelling, and swelling causes pressure in the brain, and the pressure in the brain may cause other injuries. It may uh, predispose a child to develop uh, things such as um, seizures, okay, convulsions. Uh, maybe not there and then, but maybe later in the future, they may predispose them. So traumatic brain injuries, uh, not only the brain, but also the spinal cord, because a kid falls or they're riding a motorcycle and they, they fall, they fall on their head, they injure their head, their neck, and they may become paralyzed. Uh, they may become quadriplegics, paraplegics, or whatever the case may be, uh, or even drownings. Some kids that are have uh, drowning experiences, they're rescued, they're, they're able to live, but they may have some kind of um, uh, brain tissue death. If they're without oxygen for a prolonged period of time, they may have a uh, brain tissue death. So again, uh, it depends on the type of uh, accident or condition that they may, they may uh, experience. Now, when they're in the hospital, uh, they are going to be placed usually in an in a induced coma, meaning they're medicated so that they can be in that, in that, um, in that condition so that give time for the brain to, to recover, to heal, okay? Until the dangerous part, you know, kind of maybe two to three days when all the swelling goes down and everything else uh, recovers, they may be uh, awoken, okay? Or awakened from that induced coma gradually, slowly, so that the child can, can uh, hopefully recover. And uh, to what degree they're gonna recover? Well, we don't know. That's, you know, some of the things in the brain are very difficult to measure. Uh, we, the only thing we can go by is what we've seen in the past and in similar situations. But again, every kid, every child is going to heal differently. They're going to react differently. So uh, there's a lot of questions, unanswered questions for the parents. And unfortunately, um, uh, these things happen, accidents happen. I, uh, we continue our conversation in uh, care of the pediatric patient. And now we are going to discuss uh, disorders of the gastrointestinal system in young children. Uh, some of these are genital anomalies that happen uh, with birth defects. And so some of the children will have some of these, but not very common. So the more common uh, problems that we see are diarrhea and vomiting. Diarrhea uh, in small children, especially infants less than one year old, are usually caused by some kind of a bacterial or viral contamination that they obtain from, from somewhere. Uh, more commonly, we call this uh, a rotavirus. You might remember that viruses cannot be uh, cured with antibiotics, only bacteria infections, but uh, we, we have to treat the symptoms of the infection as well. So where a infant has a rotavirus infection, they're gonna have diarrhea, uh, usually watery diarrhea, um, and then, it, so we have to treat the symptoms, including uh, rehydration. Rehydration is uh, probably the most important thing. If we don't replace the electrolytes, the fluids that uh, a child should normally have, uh, they can get dehydrated and obviously have other severe complications. So it is very important that we observe the child, uh, their, their elimination, uh, what kind of uh, bowel movements are they having. Uh, as they become more formed um, bowel movements, we know that the child is recuperating. Now, when a, uh, an infant or a, a pediatric patient has a rotavirus infection, we usually want to treat the patient with uh, usually IV hydration, but also uh, NPO status, mean nothing by mouth. The child will have to keep uh, from um, eating any kind of food that might potentially exacerbate the problem or make it worse. Uh, we do encourage oral fluids, but sometimes kids don't wanna drink fluids because they know they're gonna have more diarrhea. But uh, so that's why we intervene with IV therapy. So again, uh, you will need to carefully monitor the child's intake and output. How much are they intaking and how much are they putting out? Uh, obviously, if they're putting more out than they're taking in. Uh, we have a deficit. The child will become dehydrated and possibly uh, have other uh, medical problems, electrolyte imbalances, and so on. So note the stool's amount. How much do they, uh, do they make? If it's a small child that has a diaper, again, we're going to be weighing the diapers for urine and for stool. Or, or total, okay? So uh, how much do they go? If they go in a potty, we have to actually kind of measure because it's more liquid. You measure the amount of, um, of output that they're having. 
uh, does it look foamy, frothy? What kind of stools are they having? So it's really important to note the, the type and amount of, uh, of bowel movements that they're having when they have a rotavirus infection. It is part of our job uh, because the diarrhea can quickly uh, irritate the skin around the rectal area, the peri wound uh, rectal area. It's important to also note the surrounding skin, not just uh, the stool, but remember we can't forget about all the rest of the organs. When we provide holistic care to a child, uh, everything is affected. We okay, cannot just the GI system, it's not just that, it's the skin, the psychological, the physiological, how are their bio signs, and so on. So we have to remember to make sure that we perform um, holistic care uh, with every patient, especially pediatric patients in this case. Other GI problems that you might encounter are those kids that are born with a, a, a congenital anomalies such as um, esophageal atresia. Now atresia means that an opening that is supposed to be, op uh, an air, I'm sorry, a passage that is supposed to be normally open like your esophagus, your, your airway is supposed to be open. In, in this case, it's, it's closed, okay? So a child that is born with esophageal, meaning your esophagus, atresia meaning that your esophagus is closed at one point, okay? So kids that are born with esophageal atresia, Sometimes the esophagus and the airway connect, okay? So the esophagus connects uh, to the airway, which of course is a problem because in, when they're eating, whatever is supposed to go into the stomach is going into the, the lungs. So obviously this is a very big problem. We cannot have that. So they need uh, emergency uh, surgery to close that connection, okay? So how are they gonna eat? Well, most of the time these kids will um, have to rely on um, uh, gastrostomy. Uh, we talked about that in, <clears throat> in CNA. Uh, we talked about gastrostomies with adults, but children can also have gastrostomies, either be temporary or even permanent. So you might care for a child that has a gastrostomy. You might ask, why do you need a gastrostomy? The problem may be because they were born with um, esophageal atresia. So now you know what that means. So they will be uh, receiving, you know, um, the, the milk, you know, the, it comes in liquid form into the, into the peg tube. And that is how they're going to be um, getting them, their nutrition. So again, we have to make sure that they don't aspirate, that they don't get any food or liquid into the lungs because it's normally, uh, if they do, we have to report it, obviously. So there's, uh, again, a lot of things, you know, a lot of parents, uh, the child may wonder why they have this little tube in them, uh, their nutritional needs. Uh, we have to make sure that they get adequate. Are they tolerating the, the milk, you know, directly into the stomach? Uh, you know, we have to perform oral care because since they're not eating orally, they may not be um, caring for their mouth as usual and so on. So again, look at the whole child to make sure that we understand or meet all their, all their uh, physical uh, and nutritional needs first and then the other needs. So another problem you might encounter is called an imperfect anus, uh, imperfect anus, meaning um, the anus is closed, okay? It's supposed to be perforated or open, obviously, you have bowel movements. In this case, the child has a, a, an anus that did not develop. They missed the anal ring that was supposed to open so we can have a bowel movements. Uh, is closed or did not form, okay? Now, sometimes this can be done surgically right away, but sometimes it's not time, it's too early. So the child may have to rely on an artificial opening to their, to their colon called the colostomy, where they're gonna be able to have their bowel movements through there. Remember, we must be able to eliminate. What goes in must come out. So the child will have a colostomy, again, for a determined amount of time. As the child gets older and have more tissue, the surgeons can perhaps uh, create an anal, an anus for them and they can have their, their bowel movements that way. But this may be, again, later down the road. Hernias are another problem that are often seen with children. They happen because they have a weak um, abdominal muscles or something happens where they develop a different kinds of hernias. You have umbilical hernias, which is the little bulges that form under, under umbilicus, like little bumps that form there. Uh, again, if their intestines uh, bulge through their you know, through umbilicus, it's called an umbilical hernia. Some of these resolve on their own, they go by themselves with time, but sometimes they stay there for, for a long time, but they're usually benign, meaning they don't have any, they don't cause any problems, they're just there. And later on, they, they, they you know, may go away. Uh, inguinal hernias, happen when the loop of an intestine bulges, okay? It may happen in the lower abdomen usually. The lower abdominal wall is usually weaker and it may happen where the intestines are, you know, you can see a big ball 
This is called an inguinal hernia where your, uh, your intestines are bulging out. You may have a hiatal hernia, hiatal hernia. This is when the other parts of your body, not necessarily your intestines, are bulging out you know, to the abdomen. You can see a big ball or big lump. Uh, this may be caused by uh, some other organ, again, passing through the hiatus. The hiatus is an opening that develops when we're born. So where the esophagus goes down into your abdominal cavity, where this part, okay, esophagus coming down, and it goes into your stomach, right? There's, a, there's a, an opening called the hiatus, right, where it goes through, okay? And if it, this hiatus is too large or it doesn't close enough, when the, your diaphragm is forming, what happens? Well, organs will want to protrude through there, okay? So you might have a big ball here. This is called a hiatal hernia, okay? It may be small. It may be large. Some are very painful, very uncomfortable. It can affect your, your activities of daily living, you know, such as bending, stooping, exercising, lifting. So it becomes a serious problem. So they can be, uh, they can be fixed, okay, uh, with time, uh, as long as it's not causing, you know, severe problems. Uh, other things that you might also see, uh, see uh, with uh, young children um, are called omphalocele. Omphalocele is the inf uh, infant's intestine or other abdominal organs protruding through an opening around their umbilicus. So some children, they have their umbilicus, you know, and they may have a big wall around there. That is considered an omphalocele. An omphalocele, protrusion of your intestine or other body organs protruding through the area around the umbilicus, okay? Um, treatment for these um, may, may be done surgically uh, soon after they're born, but if it's too large, uh, they may need more than one surgery, okay? So again, this is a, another problem that the, the infant or may have to be uh, coming back to the hospital and having recurrent hospitalizations to have surgical repair uh, of this umphalocele. And they're pretty large. They can become a, a very large uh, after they're born. Appendicitis is probably one of the most common things that we see in young children. The appendix becomes infected or inflamed. Now the appendix is a little pouch that hangs uh, right where your small intestine and your large intestine connect. <clears throat> it's supposed to uh, serve as a, as, a, as a gate to keep infections out of your large intestine. It occurs more often in boys, uh, usually uh, from 10 year old, maybe up to 30 year old very common. So uh, the common symptoms are of lower abdominal pain. They may have nausea, vomiting, or even diarrhea if they have an infection. So uh, appendicitis, again, inflammation of your appendix uh, is treatable, but it has to be treated right away because if that appendix ruptures and uh, the, all the contents spread into your peritoneum, which is uh, this part of your abdomen, all that infection can cause severe, severe infection. Uh, we call it sepsis. And um, it can be life-threatening. So an appendicitis um, or appendix has to be removed surgically immediately as soon as the symptoms are discovered. I want to uh, obviously, if a, a young child has an appendix uh, or an appendectomy, removal of the appendix, they're going to go under surgery. They're going to have abdominal pain. Uh, so we have to look, evaluate, in all you know the aspects of the child, the nutritional needs. Are they getting um, enough? or not enough uh, intake? Are they outputting? We have to look at their surgical incision. We have to measure their vital signs, their temperature, the pulse, and so on. So again, it's care of the complete child in, um, when, once they have an appendectomy. So we continue conversation in care of the pediatric patient um, with endocrine disorders. Now, the most common problem that you can see with children um, and endocrine problems are is diabetes type 1. Diabetes type 1 is considered an autoimmune disorder. What it means is that the, the pediatric patient's body, uh, his own system, attacks the, the cells of the pancreas, which uh, make up uh, insulin. So when this happens, obviously, the patient doesn't have insulin and is not able to use the sugar that they're eating. So how do we know? Um, a lot of the uh, signs that we see is slow growth, uh, weight loss, and lack of energy. Uh, it, remember, if when you eat, your body is going to use up that sugar as energy. But if it's unable to because uh, there is no insulin to help the cells uh, utilize that, that the sugar, then uh, the problem is uh, maybe type 1 diabetes. We call it uh, juvenile diabetes or type 1 diabetes. 
So the three factors that have to be balanced when a patient has diabetes is uh, insulin, food intake, and energy expenditure. So kids are not, you know, like adults where everything's already pretty much stabilized or de declining. Uh, children are growing at certain, you know, um, stages of life, and some are more active than others. So it becomes a real challenge to balance those three things out, their insulin needs, their in, uh, food intake, and their energy expenditures. Now, kids want to live a normal life just like their other friends. So it becomes a real challenge to balance these out. So at times, some kids may uh, develop complications, more like hypoglycemia or low blood sugars. Okay, so now to balance those out or to prevent it, we teach these kids to be able to first recognize the symptoms, okay, and second, manage the symptoms. What do you do? Usually we give them some kind of candy. We, we ask them to carry around either uh, uh, hard candy or uh, sometimes gums that are special, uh, specially used uh, or designed to help uh, children with these problems so that in case of emergency, they can pop a gum in there, start chewing it, and that sugar goes automatically into the bloodstream to help them uh, elevate their the blood sugars. So you have to recognize the signs of low blood sugar, which are weakness, uh, lethargy, which is kind of like um, being kind of like really sleepy, that's called lethargy, or fatigue, increased, you know, tiredness, like they don't have any energy at all. They may uh, become, sometimes have headaches or uh, want to eat food. If they become hungry, they want to eat just because the blood sugars are already down, okay? So hypoglycemia occurs when the blood glucose, uh, glucose levels drop too low, okay? For children, um, the levels can, you know, can drastically change from one moment to another. So it's very, very important that we take a good look at uh, observation uh, of these kids with diabetes type one. All right, so we continue conversation and care of the pediatric uh, patient with special care concerns. There's some children that are going to have problems, uh, uh, usually congenital problems. They're born with uh, uh, genital urinary system, which is uh, malformed. In this case, we, we are going to talk about cryptorchidism. Cryptorchidism is a condition where the, the child is born with, um, with their testes do not descend into the scrotum. So when a child is born, usually the testes by themselves drop into the scrotum. Okay? However, sometimes the testes do not fall into the scrotum. And for this reason, the, the, the patient or the, in, the pediatric patient may have to go through surgical um, uh, procedure to help those testes uh, drop into the, into the scrotum, okay? If not, they're going to experience uh, either some kind of um, uh, hernia problem, they're gonna be having pain and or some other uh, obstruction of the testes. So again, this condition is uh, caused by congenital deformity and uh, usually resolves on its own, but at times it may require, require surgical intervention. Another problem that you'll see is a, a more common one is called hypospadias or epispadias. Hypo means low, so the opening of the of the of the urethra on the outside we call it the meatus, right? So if the opening of the of the of the where the urine comes out in a boy, okay, we're talking about a, a male, uh, the ur usually comes out to the very tip to the front and out comes the urine. However, in hypospadias, the opening the meatus is going to be underneath the head of the of the um, of the penis, okay, on the on the infant. So the urine will come down instead of going forward, okay? So this can present a problem, obviously, uh, as the child grows older, you know, may, make it very difficult for them to urinate normally. So uh, this, uh, sometimes the, the opening, the meatus is on top of the, um, of the penis. And obviously this, you know, will cause a problem with urination. The patient will, will not be able to urinate correctly. So, these two problems can be corrected surgically, usually, you know, in their young years, maybe in about a one to two years old, and uh, it may be created in you know, one in one surgery or may require more than one surgery. But this problem can be corrected uh, surgically uh, in their very young years uh, to prevent, you know, uh, developmental problems. You know, a child that grows up with that problem, obviously, you know, may not grow up to be uh, normal or may even have reproductive problems in the future if they, if the problem is not taken care of immediately. Okay, the next section um, in care of the pediatric patient with special concerns is the musculoskeletal uh, system. Now, children 
uh, for the most part are born normal. Okay, they have no musculoskeletal problems. When a child when a child is born, uh, the nurse is responsible to perform a musculoskeletal assessment. You know, we check for uh, what we call hip dysplasia. So we open up the hips, we move the arms. You know, we look at the children's uh, position when they're born, usually with their their um, hands up position and their hips are usually also uh, abducted, you know, they're turned outwards and we move them back and forth and back, you know, side to side. We make sure that the hips have full range of motion, the arms have full range of motion and so on. So we do this we're using a tool and we take it off. However, sometimes kids are born with, or with certain congenital problems we'll discuss in just a minute. But the most common problems that we probably see are fractures. Fractures that are caused by automobile accidents, trauma, you know, accidents in the playground and so on. Uh, sometimes, the, they may have a dislocation of a of a joint, uh, which uh, the doctor, you know, when they take them to the emergency room, they can close, they can align that, you know, that arm or or the leg, they can realign it without having to do any surgery. That's called closed reduction. So, however, sometimes the 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 child may have a a fracture that is too severe that will require surgical intervention. In this case, the Pediatric patient will go to the to the to the hospital. Obviously, have a surgical procedure to repair the fracture. Uh, that means they're going to open. Okay. They, once they open the skin, they call it open reduction or opening. Okay. And if they have to insert pins or or rods or anything to 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 fix that fracture, then we call it internal fixation. Okay. So it's going to be open reduction and internal fixation. So they put pins and rods or whatever they need to be able to to uh, make sure that that limb, the arm or leg is stays aligned. So when a kid has a fracture, it'd be the wrist or an, uh, one of the, the bones of the arms, you know, the upper arm. Remember with all this range of motion that we have, we take it from granted. And it's not that easy to make sure that the bones are, you know, in align. Okay. So sometimes they use this big, uh, what they call external fixators. They, they're like sort of metal, um, uh, devices that you know have pins sticking out and all you know we, we talked about pin care the other day so this is why external fixators are used to make sure that the the, the joint stays in in the in their normal position if not you know, you know you have rotation right source reflection you have all these movements to just this joint okay sideways up and down so if this is not fixed correctly you will not be able to have complete range of motion like you did before. So it's very important that uh, the surgical procedure that is, um, that is done is done uh, correctly and that obviously we take care of it. Sometimes kids will require a, um, a cast. A cast is uh, very important too. If a kid suffers a fracture, uh, maybe it's just a, a closed fracture, it's not that bad, a hairline fracture, the doctor realigns it in a closed reduction and then they put a cast on it. So when a child has a cast, we have to keep a very close eye on it. Number one, circulation is number one. We must ensure that the toes you know, uh, are open, obviously, and that they're pink, right? We can uh, check by pressing down on the tips of the toe and they will blanch. That means they will turn white and then blood flow will return to them. They turn pink again. That is a good sign. If a child ever reports you numbness or tingling to the toes, that is a severe problem. Now, why, why would they ever experience that? Because that means they're having a uh, circulatory problem. There's no blood flow going there. Now, if they had blood flow before, why did it, did it stop all of a sudden? Well, maybe because there's increased swelling inside the, inside the leg, inside the cast, uh, causing obstruction of blood flow to the toes. Obviously, they have to be taken to the emergency room and then they will have to perform what they call a, a, a window, right? They make an incision, a cut on the cast, without obviously cutting the person so that they can relieve pressure from the swelling. Now, why do they have swelling? Or well, they might have an infection. Why did they get an infection? Usually because kids will get uh, very itchy in under the cast. They get itchy and they start scratching or they get something and they stick it in between the cast and they start scratching, opening their skin, causing an infection. And this is how complications can occur. So we always have to monitor the skin around, around the, uh, on the cast and make sure that they're not scratching. If there's any foul odors, you know, coming from the cast, uh, you know, the person complains of pain, things like that, you must report these, um, these symptoms uh, or, or signs right away because it could be 
uh, you know, a necrotic already, maybe a wound that's been there going down for days on and it's already getting black or it could be a serious complication can uh, develop into what we call sepsis, okay? Uh, serious uh, uh, blood infection. So it's very important that we keep an eye on number one, circulation. Number two, uh, uh, the skin, okay? Look out for the signs of infection, very important. Other uh, problems that some kids are born with, they call it hip dysplasia, okay? Dysplasia means out of place, okay? Like displaced, it's called dysplasia. Hip dysplasia, sometimes the kids are born with their hips. Let's say this is a hip, okay? The hip is normally um, this joint, you know, stays in the pelvis, okay? Remember, this is the hip, this is the hip, this is the hip, this is the femur, all right, the leg. And this joint, you know, that ball that we have there on the joint goes into the socket. Well, sometimes when they close the leg, this part wants to come out, okay? This is called hip dysplasia. So they can pop it back in, but then the problem is going to reoccur when they again move around. So it's important that uh, this gets fixed uh, as soon as possible. Sometimes the, the kids will be put in a, what they call a, like a splint to keep their legs up, uh, abducted, open up like this, so that this ball stays in the pocket, okay? So will they be able to walk? Not really. If they can, it's gonna be a very awkward, you know, way of walking, okay, because of the hip dysplasia. If they close their legs to walk in a narrow stance like a normal, then this wants to pop out. So it'll be have they'll have hip dysplasia. So we keep them like this until they you know they keep growing and hopefully the pocket will the joint will stay in their pocket. So let's say it didn't work. Okay, they were gonna have to undergo a surgical procedure to to repair this uh, this anomaly, this problem. Okay, and once they have that surgery. They're going to be placed when they call a spica cast. A spica cast is a cast that goes from the waist all the way down. Okay, that way they're pretty much going to be fixed in this position, just like they were with the spleen before. They're going to be like this. Why? Because obviously kids do not stay still, so they need to be placed in this position. So a cast we talked about earlier, all the complications that can occur with a cast. All right, think about it. You being fixed in a cast in this position for weeks maybe even months, how would, what's gonna happen? Mobility, serious problem. You're gonna have a lot of atrophy, muscular uh, atrophy. Your muscles get smaller, they get weak, okay? Elimination problems, okay? You're not gonna be moving around too much. So there's a lot of other things, complications that can happen because of the spike cast, but this is a needed procedure for those patients that, um, that require the, the surgery for a hip dysplasia. Another problem that you might encounter uh, more is juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. Just like uh, diabetes, juvenile RA uh, is caused by an autoimmune disorder. So your body thinks the joints don't belong there, right? Like the joints are your hands. Your body thinks they're, they're, they don't belong there. So it attacks it, okay? This is an autoimmune disorder. Your body attacks itself. In this case, it attacks your joints, okay? So what is, how does it affect you? Well, you have pain. You have stiffness, loss of mobility, and dexterity, okay? And, and this is for very young children, usually 10, 15 years old. It's a severe problem because you can't function normally, okay? You're going to have a lot of pain. Uh, this uh, arthritis can also affect other parts of your body, including your uh, heart, lungs, liver, and so on. So it's not just about your joints, but also other parts of your body that might be affected because of the autoimmune condition. Uh, medications, therapy, and surgery may be necessary. Medications usually are going to be chronic. They're going to be taking them for probably a very long time, which medications themselves create other complications. So you have to be aware of what they're taking, the side effects of those medications. A lot of them are called steroids, and those medications have a lot of side effects over the long run, long-term use, even over the counter medications you know, like ibuprofen, Tylenol. They have complications over, you know, uh, for a long period of time. So you have to make sure that you understand, like, again, holistic care. How does this condition affect the child? Not only their physical, but their psychological, their physiological, their functional. We have to look at everything about a patient, uh, a patient with a juvenile uh, rheumatoid arthritis. So keep that in mind. Another condition that you might uh, see is a congenital condition called muscular dystrophy. Okay, there's a lot of children that are born with this condition. Uh, fortunately, they're unable to to walk, a lot of them you see them uh, in wheelchairs and they're usually kind of in, a, in a, a position where they're sitting forward, okay? Some of them may be, be you know, rocking back and forth so you see them in the wheelchairs. These children um, uh, are usually diagnosed at around four years old, 
okay, when they're unable to start walking. Hopefully, you know, when you look at a child and you see the developmental stages, the milestones that we have to reach at each stage in life, like, you know, let's say by six months, the, the infant should already be maybe uh, crawling or, you know, by one year they should be standing or, you know, uh, fencing, you know, walking around, holding on to, to, to things. So they have, we have to reach these milestones. If a child is a year and a half and they haven't stood up, you know, they're not waddling around, they're not trying to walk, that's a big red flag, okay? So again, we have to pay attention to the milestones of these children as they're developing, especially when they're kids because they're growing so fast, they have so many little milestones they have to reach. And if we don't pay attention to that, you know, we can just brush it off and say, well, maybe he's low, maybe he's shy, maybe he's afraid. We can't be thinking like that. Muscular dystrophy is a, a congenital disorder. Unfortunately, there is no cure for it, okay? But the sooner we catch it, uh, uh, sooner the, the child can get treatment. But again, all the muscles uh, atrophy. That means it gets smaller and weaker, especially your abdominal muscles. They have trouble breathing, you know, uh, and this is why they, you know, they sit forward because, you know, they have trouble holding themselves up in an in erect in position. They usually don't walk. And because of the lack of movement, range of motion, a lot of times they start to get contracted. Their hands get contracted and their arms. And you see them sometimes in a fixed position. You know, this is why, because of the lack of movement. They weren't like that when they were younger. They eventually, they, they develop, you know, these contractions of the arms, you know, and their body goes like that uh, going forward. So, uh, again, this is a congenital disorder they're born with, and there is no cure for it. But we do have to treat them like every other patient. Again, holistically, you know, their nutritional needs, elimination needs, um, everything about them, you know, psychological needs and so on. We have to treat them just like any good child. Okay, so we're talking about the pediatric patient, uh, special care concerns. In this case, we're gonna talk about cancer, which is a, a, a very serious topic. Some kids are sometimes born or develop a, a cancers of the blood. So what is a cancer? A cancer is uncontrollable growth or abnormal growth of cells. In this case, the most common problem that we see with children and cancer is leukemia. Leuco means white, okay? So white blood cells are produced in large amounts, okay? But they're abnormal cells. They are not able to, to uh, perform the normal functions of the immune system. So what happens with a child that produces too many white blood cells? Um, in this case, the abnormal leukocytes are unable to function properly, okay? When leukemia occurs, the first signs that we see is their inability to recover from uh, typical illnesses like the flu, common cold, et cetera. If they're unable to recover, you know, within a, a reasonable, you know, time frame, like a week, maybe two weeks, and where they have recurrent infections, uh, that may be a red flag. A child that is unable to to uh, recover quickly can can show signs of uh, leukemia. So again, uh, they do develop a pale discoloration perhaps because of the, the increased amounts of white blood cells that are circulating in the bloodstream. Uh, sometimes they become anemic. So these children that had developed leukemia will require uh, a lot of treatment uh, uh, for cancer, uh, which involves uh, chemotherapy. Chemotherapy is pretty much uh, toxic to the body, but it is used to kill off these excessive white blood cells and help the child uh, live a, a normal life as possible. Now, this is all... Um, what we call a palliative, I mean palliative just to relieve symptoms. It's not a cure. Uh, there are very successful chemotherapy uh, treatments uh, to this day. And so a lot of kids can go off, actually get cured uh, or go on remission for a while. Uh, sometimes, however, these cells come back and reproduce. These white blood cells are produced in, in the bone marrow, which is where all our, our blood cells are produced, your red blood cells, when white blood cells, platelets, they're all produced in the bone marrow. So it is very difficult to, to cure uh, leukemia. There are other treatments that involve a bone marrow transplants, which is receiving bone marrow from another a person. Uh, uh, it is a rather successful um, treatment. Uh, about 50% of the, the patients that uh, receive a bone marrow transplant actually are able to, to, to live you know, uh, an extended amount of time. It, uh, some actually get cured. Uh, however, some don't. 
but they continue their battle with um, with uh, chemotherapy and other other methods. So when a person, a young child, is receiving chemotherapy or an adult, uh, chemotherapy affects your overall immune system. Okay, sometimes they are uh, immune system drops too low where they are susceptible to to any kind of infection. So you have to make sure that uh, we look again holistically at the person. We have to treat them. Uh, we're very careful, very practice, very good um, aseptic technique, wash your hands, wear gloves, even wear a mask. Uh, we have to protect them from us. So we, we call that uh, protective isolation or reverse isolation, where we, the healthcare employees, have to wear the mask to not give anything to them. Remember, we sometimes we carry things around. We don't know what we have. And if we come into contact with a, with a person that has un, is undergoing chemotherapy, and we may be carrying an infection, and we pass it on to them, that could be their death sentence. So it's very, very important that we have a patient uh, that is on reverse isolation or protective isolation. You have to make sure that you make sure that you wear your PPE, right? Your gown, uh, your gloves, and wash your hands and so on. So it's very important that you follow those um, infection control precautions with those type of uh, patients. Not only the protective isolation, but also we have to make sure that uh, we evaluate everything. Chemotherapy affects your entire body system, okay? especially your nutritional. A lot of these uh, patients that are on chemotherapy uh, lose their appetite. They have diarrhea. You know, again, chemotherapy is a poison okay, for your body, but at times it can help to, to alleviate the symptoms or uh, slow down the process of, of cancer. So again, don't forget about the whole patient when they're receiving chemotherapy because every part of their body, including their mental status, is affected. Think about what they're going through. What are they thinking with this condition? Very, very important. All right, the last topic we're going to cover in care of the pediatric patient uh, and special concerns is child abuse. Child abuse um, is a topic that is taken very seriously and that is very um, important that we keep an eye on. As healthcare providers, we are responsible to report by law any, any suspected abuse. You don't have to see it, you don't have to witness it. If you uh, suspect that a child is being abused, you must report it immediately. Now, if it, when you, you're talking to a child and you listen to them and they may mention something, uh, related to, to abuse, either be physical abuse, emotional abuse, or even uh, sexual abuse. Uh, sometimes the children will role play that. They may be playing with the dolls and they may say something you know, about, uh, you know, this little teddy bear is hitting the other teddy bear because they were bad and so on. That may raise a flag and you might suspect it. Now, it's not your job to, to investigate the child. Uh, don't do that because when we do that, we may start putting uh, words in their mouth, right? So if a child um, is, you know, role playing something like that, you might be asked, you know, oh, why is this, you know, why is this teddy bear hitting this teddy bear? You know, why is it? And the child may explain, uh, and you have to report, you know, uh, the 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 suspected abuse or whatever the child tells you as they are saying it, okay, in their little words, right, in the way to describe things because that's how they see it. So again, very important that we report this immediately to the nurse or there's uh, people that um, get specialized in, in, in dealing with, with uh, this type of cases. So again, it is not our job to, to judge the parents or it, this may be something, maybe a child saw on television or something, we don't know. So it's not our job to, to investigate and decide whether or not this child has been abused physically, mentally, uh, emotionally, or even sexually, but it is our job by law to report it, okay? Many times, there are social workers in every facility. Social workers are, are more equipped to deal with these kind of situations, or even, uh, you know, uh, they may request the assistance of other uh, specialized individuals that deal with, with child abuse. Of course, uh, the authorities will have to be involved. Again, again, do not feel uh, bad because we're reporting this. You're just acting in good faith on behalf of the child, the, their welfare and their well being. So it's important that we do it. And if we don't report it, then we can be held responsible, okay? You may be accused also of being a, a, a codependent of abuse of this child. So it's taken very seriously. Again, just be very careful with you know, what you say to the child, 
you know, just listen and report things as they say to them. Signs of, uh, of abuse of a child uh, in the home setting, uh, you know, it may be uh, physical neglect, uh, it may be uh, emotional neglect. You can see signs of the home, it's unkept, it's dirty, uh, the poor personal hygiene by the child, you know, they're not being well-groomed, well-kept uh, with a loss of weight or dehydration, obviously neglect, or, you know, it's, it's a form of abuse. Uh, marks, obviously burn marks, bruises, unexplained bruises. Uh, the child is withdrawn. They don't want to talk to you. You know, the caregiver, sometimes they just want to be there next to them. They want to be listening to whatever it is that you're talking to them. They want to hear what the child says and the child does not really want to uh, participate. These are kind of signs that, you know, the, the child may be undergoing uh, some type of abuse. Excessive sexual curiosity, you know, the children at that stage, um, some children are curious at times, uh, sexually, when, you know, but excessive, you know, that's a red flag, okay? Children should not be that well um, familiar with sexuality at that stage in their life. And sleeping problems, uh, anxiety, okay? Uh, controlled medical conditions, uh, a history of recurring healthcare for similar injuries. So there's a lot of signs that, um, that you know, sometimes become uh, a pattern. If you see patterns, you know, a child going to the hospital, you know, frequently, frequently, maybe something, some other problem that the parents might have. So again, any signs of abuse or neglect, uh, any signs of suspected abuse or neglect have to be reported by law. We are uh, required to report these immediately. And with that, uh, we're gonna end the discussion and, and care of the pediatric patients. It's a lengthy chapter. But again, this gives you a very good insight as to the more, co more common problems that you'll see uh, in, um, in the specialty areas of the, of the pediatric patients. Uh, so you might, again, be uh, trained in the specific area of where it is that you decide to work in, because you know, this is a very generalized idea of what, what it takes to care for children. And if you decide to work in a cancer hospital, you know, like Driscoll's Hospital or some especially the hospital where they work with maybe burnt children or, or children that have physical impairments, you know, not just work with the, the problem, but you also remember the holistic care. Always remember to provide holistic care to, to the child and any patient for that matter. So with that, we finish it. We'll continue uh, our next conversation in the obstetric patient.